industry can work directly with organizations to get the facts out there. Practice sustainability. Bringing the facts to the public about the issue. We are living in an age of misinformation. Celebrities, politicians, and eco-activists are spreading rhetoric that could actually be harmful to you and me. I'm Patrick Moore, the sensible environmentalist, and I'm about to set the record straight on fracking natural gas and some of the important products made from it. You've seen it all before. Protests, bans, documentaries, even feature films, all against fracking. Whole cities banning natural gas and Greenpeace campaigns calling polyvinyl chloride, also known as PVC, or simply vinyl, the poison plastic. All these campaigns, legislation, and documentaries are based on rhetoric. It's time to start thinking critically. Let's start with fracking. Fracking is one of the dumbest technologies there is. We have no idea what is under the ground. You know, it's, we're kind of, because we're an air-breathing land lubber living on the top skin of the planet, we think out of sight, there's nothing down there. Actually, David, we do know what is below the surface. And deep down, sometimes more than a mile below the surface, is something called shale. Many of these shale deposits, which are ancient marine sediments, composed mainly of the skeletons of tiny marine plankton, contain large deposits of natural gas and oil. The gas and oil were formed under heat and pressure from the organic bodies of the plankton. Fracking is a way for us to access that natural gas. Hydraulic fracturing has been around for more than half a century, but recent technology called horizontal drilling has changed the way and amount of natural gas that we can access. And here's how it works. First, a drill rig is assembled and the drilling begins. During the entire drilling process, cement and steel casings are used to create an impermeable barrier between the well and the groundwater. After all, the gas companies don't want the natural gas to escape. The vertical drilling continues until it hits the shale zone, often 6,000 to 10,000 feet down, where it is directed to turn 90 degrees to allow horizontal drilling. Once the well is completely drilled, a perforating device is inserted to create small punctures in the horizontal part of the cement casing. Then fluids, mostly water and sand, are pumped down the well at high pressure, 9,000 pounds per square inch, creating tiny fractures in the shale. The water carries the sand into the fractures, which holds them open when the water pressure is released. The gas contained in the shale then flows up the well to the surface, where pipes carry it to a gas processing plant, where impurities such as sulfur, carbon dioxide, and water are removed. The gas is then delivered to end users through a system of pipelines. The entire process takes only a couple of weeks a huge underground area of shale can be tapped from a small pad on the surface. Natural gas will flow from that pad for up to 40 years, after which the site will be restored to nature by returning the topsoil that was removed and planting the site with native species of trees and other plants. So what's the problem here? Because all I see are positives, such that fracking is a low impact solution for energy and fracking has moved the United States to the biggest energy producer in the world. And if you are concerned about it, fracked gas replacing coal for electricity production is the main reason US emissions of carbon dioxide have declined in recent years. Well, not so fast. Fracking has attracted huge amounts of criticism. Activists stage anti-fracking protests, celebrities have benefit concerts, documentaries, feature-length movies, all opposing fracking. Even governments ban fracking in their entire jurisdictions. But all this is based on nothing more than rhetoric. In 2010, Josh Fox made a documentary called Gasland. 
My land was on top of a formation called the Marcellus Shale, and that was a Saudi Arabia of natural gas. In it, he follows several families who say they've been negatively affected by fracking in their area. It's tragic, except it's not true. And yet Fox's documentary perpetuates the biggest myths about fracking. Like that fracking contaminates groundwater. Tell me there ain't nothing wrong with this water. It smelled like turpentine. That chemical smell that goes straight to your head and gets you dizzy almost immediately. Here's the thing, you know, I think it's criminal. Potent stuff, except methane is odorless. Natural gas companies put the gas smell in it to warn of any leaks. Lewis Meeks is telling the truth. He was living on top of a lot of natural gas, but it didn't get there because of fracking. Meeks' house sits on top of a conventional underground reservoir. Conventional gas wells were drilled there in the 1980s, and when he drilled a water well, he struck the gas probably because he went 240 feet deeper than the 300 feet he had a permit for. Of course, Fox left all this out of the documentary. He also left out the fact that Meeks water is safe to drink, according to the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality. Lewis Meeks isn't the only story of so-called contaminated drinking water that Josh Fox found. The filmmaker found a whole town that claimed their water was affected from fracking. You see, the families in Dimmock, Pennsylvania, were suing Cabot Oil and Gas for contaminated water. The Department of Environmental Protection was even planning to build a water pipeline into the town. A town needs clean water, and the government was going to provide it. Just take a look at this outspoken Dimmock couple. We had uh, iron, chloride, sodium, strontium, barium, three different types of uranium. Two of them are weapons grade. Did you hear that? Weapons-grade uranium, simply impossible, as weapons-grade uranium can only be produced by enrichment in a sophisticated factory. And here's what Josh Fox leaves out this time. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or the EPA, wasn't going to take any chances with the possibility of weapons-grade uranium in the water. So they tested Dimmick's water, and they found out it was safe. Let me quote from their press release. Quote, the sampling and an evaluation of the particular circumstances at each home did not indicate levels of contaminants that would give the APA reason to take further action. Throughout EPA's work in Dimmock, the agency has used the best available scientific data to provide clarity to Dimmock residents and address their concerns about the safety of their drinking water, unquote. I couldn't think of better news for the residents of Dimmock. But for Josh Fox and the Sotners, it wasn't about the safety of their drinking water, it was about fame and fortune. The EPA recorded what happened when they gave the Sotners the good news. And fellow McAleer got that footage through an access to information request. Take a look. She's, no. she's got a problem. Well, that's, look at No, I'm, no, I'm here. I want right here, right here. I'm right not here. sitting anywhere, I'm done with this, I am. Right here. You, you can finish this, I'm done. I'm getting myself too upset for shit. No, this is bull crap, man. I'm sick and tired of this. What, what, what happened to you people? Really? Listen, you guys aren't the same as you were two months ago, three months ago. Because you think I made this stuff up? This is, this is, this, you're out of here? Yeah, I'm not going to, this is going to, you want to sit down and talk rationally to me? How can I talk rationally with you when you guys won't even listen to anything we say? I'm listening to you. You're saying my water's fine and we can drink it. We're telling you we tested your water. At this point in time, we found no contaminants in it. The people who watched Josh Fox's documentary and the media who reported on it only told the one side, the side where the poor people of Dimmock, Pennsylvania were the victims and fracking was the bad guy. But Josh Fox wasn't finished. Whoa, Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's the best I've done. <laughs> So, video evidence of tap water on fire. And again, Josh Fox doesn't bother with the truth. In this case, it's the well-documented science and history of natural gas bubbling up in spring water. Where do you think places like Burning Springs, New York, Burning Springs, West Virginia, and Burning Spring, Kentucky got their names? Is this in any way caused by fracking? No, 
It's caused by something called thermogenic natural gas from decaying plant matter. In fact, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission put out a four-page technical document referring to natural gas by its technical name, methane. Let me read from it. Quote, the gas produced from the oil and gas wells around the subject water well is thermogenic methane. Thermogenic methane gas is formed by the thermal breakdown of organic material in rocks resulting from high temperature created by deep burial." Unquote. But there's no shock and awe in naturally occurring gas deposits. So Josh Fox leaves it out, and fracking once again takes the blame. The next most common argument I hear against fracking is that it causes earthquakes. So is this true? Yep, you heard it right. Fracking causes earthquakes. But that's because the definition of an earthquake is any measurable movement in the Earth. The US Geological Survey, the agency that monitors earthquakes, detects, quote, several million, unquote, earthquakes every year. Take a look at this map. It tracks all the earthquakes in North America for one week. Over 1,300 earthquakes. And most aren't even felt. Tremors that register below three on the Richter scale are too gentle to be felt. But so do the explosions from underground mining, which are much more powerful and occur close to the surface. I'm not the only former Greenpeace leader who thinks fracking natural gas is part of a solution for a clean, affordable energy future. Stephen Tyndale, who ran Greenpeace UK from 2000 to 2005, recently said, quote, as a lifelong champion of the green cause, I'm convinced that fracking is not the problem, but a central part of the answer, unquote. There's one more myth I want to talk about. All those chemicals being injected into the earth. 98% of the fracking fluid is water and sand. Other chemicals are used, mostly as lubricants, to keep the fracking fluid moving in and out of the well. The chemicals used are all approved for this use by the environmental authorities. All this is happening deep in the earth, where there are no living creatures to harm. Look, fracking produces natural gas. It's inexpensive and accessible. And as I already mentioned, it has a low impact on the environment. So when, say, the city of Vancouver wants to ban natural gas in all new buildings, it's pure nonsense and it's feeding the lie that natural gas is bad. Natural gas has many other uses than heating buildings, from producing electricity, to cooking our food, to manufacturing fertilizers, glass, plastics, paint, and many more. It's an everyday resource that we take for granted. An example of one natural gas product that is under attack is PVC, polyvinyl chloride, or simply vinyl. Vinyl is half natural gas and half sea salt. Salt is sodium chloride, and natural gas is methane. Vinyl chloride is manufactured from the chlorine in the salt and the hydrogen and carbon in the methane. Vinyl, or PVC, is one of the most sustainable and environmentally friendly materials, as well as the most versatile and cost-effective of plastics. Vinyl is entirely non-toxic. Traditional materials used in pipes can corrode, rust, and contaminate the water. Let's take Flint, Michigan as a case study. The water supply was contaminated by iron and lead, the materials the pipes were made from. This cannot happen with PVC pipe as it does not corrode. Which is why I can't figure out why Greenpeace is campaigning against vinyl. One of their campaigns calls it the poison plastic. Why? Well, Greenpeace claims that dioxins are created in the manufacturing of vinyl. And it's true. There's a very tiny amount of dioxin produced in vinyl factories, less than one half of 1% produced by human activity, and the levels emitted are not considered harmful by the US Environmental Protection Agency. In fact, most of the dioxin produced by humans comes from incineration, wood combustion, diesel trucks, oil-fired power plants, coal-fired industry, and cement kilns. 
Vinyl is such a common everyday material. Our credit cards are made out of vinyl. Siding, roofing, flooring, wall covering, decks and railings are all made with vinyl. But vinyl is more than just a building material. Soft vinyl, made when adding plasticizers, is used in everything from life-saving medical products such as intravenous bags and tubing, toys and furniture, beach balls, packaging, kitchen utensils, and many more. So what happens when Greenpeace and other activists campaign against vinyl? Misinformation and sensationalism prevails. Vinyl has been called, quote, one of the most toxic substances saturating our planet and its inhabitants, unquote. Fear is spread by saying vinyl is, quote, linked to cancer and kidney disease, unquote. But what does the word linked mean? Linked is a trick word that is used when they can't say caused by, because there is no evidence to back it up. The National Sanitation Foundation, which is recognized as an independent certification body by the United Nations, states the following, quote, PVC pipe and fittings are resistant to chemicals generally found in water and sewer systems, preventing any leaching or releases to groundwater and surface water during the use of the piping system. No known chemicals are released internally into the water system. No known toxicity effects occur in the use of the product." Unquote. So those who reject vinyl are doing a disservice not just to toys and building materials, but the sanitary nature of our hospitals and other health facilities. Let me explain. Blood bags, intravenous tubing, surgical gloves and caps, catheters, goggles, oxygen delivery, thermal blankets, and dialysis equipment all use vinyl, not to mention vinyl flooring and wall coverings, which are used in hospitals because they are easily disinfected surfaces. So imagine healthcare without vinyl. Not only would healthcare costs increase, but the risk of infection while in a healthcare facility would increase too. Our new reality in this century is about making sure we practice sustainability on all fronts. Vinyl is one of the safest, most sustainable materials on planet Earth. So next time you see a ban on anything, from fracking to natural gas or a material like vinyl, think critically and look at the facts, not the spin. Thanks for watching. I'm Patrick Moore, the sensible environmentalist. <laughs>